Welcome to Public Power Underground, Northwest Public Power's premier weekly infotainment program that covers Northwest public power and public power adjacent news from a power department's perspective. So hey, public power people, on today's show, we'll get an update on Northwest power markets on Aaron Reports, go a little deeper on Northwest markets with eWeb's power trader, John Hart, Talk to Clark Public Utilities' Matt Babbitts about transportation electrification. Learn about a creative internship program Energy Northwest is piloting from Sarah Giomi. Return to the topic of resource adequacy with PGP's Leah Fisher. And as always, cover more public power and public power adjacent news on Public Power Desktop. I'm the voice of the underground and economic development manager for Klatskin IPUD, Brian Fawcett. I'm Paul Dockery, the manager of the Power Department and co-host of Public Power Underground. This is Aaron Guillory, the star of Aaron Reports, a co-star of Public Power Underground and financial analyst for Klatskin IPUD. And I'm Ian Bledsoe, still the power analyst and co-star of Public Power Underground. Still? Yeah, still. <laughs> Are you still also a uh, captain? <laughs> Uh, I have not received any new orders, so that's my assumption. You're the captain. We're moving <laughs> moving on from the grammar police bit. We're moving on from oh. the bit. <laughs> Played out? It played out. I don't feel like it's, you know, grammar police is funny until you get attacked by grammar police on Twitter, and then it's like, it's not really funny anymore. <laughs> <laughs> good, good banter to start this off. All right, we'll, uh, we'll start after the banner with Aaron Reports. Great, let's get into it. This is Aaron Reports, where we try to get up to speed on Northwest Market Indicators for May 20th, 2021. I'm Aaron Guillory, and I've got your market update for the week. April, September flows of the Dells are expected to be at 84% of normal, and outflow at the Dells peaked over the past week at 223.6 KCFS on May 19th at 1,500 hours, down from the 241.6 KCFS peak last week, May 11th at 1,500 hours. Midday elevation at Grand Coulee on May 19th was 1,273.10, and peak outflow this past week hit after the PPU May 13th at 164.7.7 uh, KCFS at 2,100 hours. Spot market power in the Northwest for delivery May May 20th is at $39.75 with gas at $2.77 per MMBTU, translating to spark spread of $20.36 and a heat rate of 15 grand. In term markets, bond for mid-C is now at $36.95 per megawatt hour. Mid-C power for Q3 2021 is up to 162 from 150 last Thursday with Sumus gas at $3.74, translating to a heat rate of 4 43,600. In bond markets, one California irrigation district issued 48,945,000 in electric system revenue refunding bonds with maturities due between 2021 and 2031 and average interest rates of 5% and yields of 56 bips. Taking a look at fish counts for adult spring Chinook this past week, 1,029 Chinook passed through the Bonville Dam yesterday, down from 3,713 last Thursday. Spending a beat at Bonneville's Bouncing Authority, peak low this past week was 6,916 this morning, May 20th at 7.30 in the a.m. During loads, peak hydrogen was at 8,631. Wind gen was at 1,371 megawatts. Conventional units were at 218 and zero nuclear while the Columbia Generating Station is offline for its biennial refueling and maintenance outage. This week, an NOAA for climate forecast, the 6 to 10 day outlook has temp and precipitation in the region, largely in the normal range with a 33 to 50% chance of being below normal. Their 90 day report shows likelihood of a 33 to 50% chance of below normal precip. And that's all we've got for this update. Ooh. Well done, Gillery. Thank you. I always start talking while I'm still muted. Brian, should we be worried about the fall off in the spring Chinook uh, counts from last week? Or I'm glad you asked, Paul. That was a perfect prompt. Um, it's it's normal for them to start falling off uh, right about now. They actually upgraded the run estimate for the uh, Columbia River portion of the of uh, of the run, and I think it is now expected to be eighty seven thousand fish. Uh, instead of 72 was the initial estimate. They actually opened up fishing this weekend as well as most of June, uh, which means we, uh, you know, it's due to having uh, more available fish and less. Do, 
any fishing advice uh, you can give to our faithful listeners as mm-hmm. our resident fishing expert, or do you want to keep that keep that to yourself so <laughs> that they indoors. don't come? So I was literally no, like, we we have tens of turning. listeners. I was like, we have yeah. tens of listeners. The probability that they actually, you know, are going to come to the same place as you is fairly low. It's just tens of listeners. I was just going to make something up to avoid that, but no, there's uh, the the river is huge and there's plenty of opportunity. The water is warming up. So that means more artificial stuff like spinners can be used instead of bait. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, there, uh, there's the best quality fish right now in the Columbia River. People need to go out there and get them and, and enjoy it. Hopefully we That's get great. some nice weather. That's great. The first lead this week is about markets. So instead of uh, chatting markets to close out Aaron reports, why don't we move right on to Public Power Desktop? Take it away, Brian. So thanks for the report, Aaron. Next up is our weekly walk through Northwest Public Power and Public Power adjacent news in a segment we like to call Public Power Desktop. This week, Klatskanai PUD had our monthly market update with Answer Chief. Ever helpful and a great source of information, the meeting concluded with a unique market take we're calling the Harkwahala Hypothesis. For several years, Harkwahala Generating Station, an 1100 megawatt nameplate combined cycle unit located in Tonopa, Arizona, and owned by Talon Energy, has been offline due to what is believed to be non-economic reasons. In mid-May, Harkwahala had its first gas nomination in three years, sourced from the El Paso pipeline. The Harkwahala hypothesis is best summarized as the theory that Palo Verde is driving summer pricing throughout the WEC, but summer 2021 forwards haven't accounted for the potential addition of nearly 900 megawatts of baseload energy coming back online. Once Harkwahala arrives, it may pull the Palo Verde forwards back to pre-2020 settled price levels. Answer G has answers for energy, and we have lots of questions. The Harkwahala hypothesis got us wondering what other theories Northwest market experts have. So we reached out to one of the coolest people in public power, eWeb's power trader, a friend, colleague, and the Public Power Underground special market philosophies correspondent, John Hart. Hey, John, welcome to Public Power Underground. Hey, thanks for having me. I uh, wanted to get you on for a long time. Big fan of John Hart, big fan of your perspective on markets. Um, And I've been thinking a lot, obviously there's a great big uh, price pressure for July and August that's uh, very obvious to everyone. It's like a big red thumb sticking out there. Even I can notice it. Um, And it's, and we've had some conversations with Ansergy because we're, we subscribe to their services and there's hypotheses about what could be going on. And, you know, I thought I'll reach out to other smart people I know, for instance, John Hart, and see if they have some market philosophies. So if you're willing, I would love John's philosophy of market fundamentals in like 200 words or less. You think you can do it? I'll do my best. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you. I, I decide I'm gonna clock it. Let's see what you can do. Okay, let's let's see where we go. So generally speaking, you know there are some strong market incentives out there at the present moment. You know, for years uh, we've had low prices. You know, kind of driven by you know fracking and advancing clean energy regulation, and that's really shifted generator economics and marginalized opportunities and increased cap- capacity scarcity. And now we have two recent examples in both California and Texas where capacity events can quickly turn into energy events with extreme heat and cold. This appears to be driving a surge in term market purchases and uh, forward prices in general. If we want, we can view this development in a positive light because unlike spot markets, forward markets uh, can drive many smaller but needed changes or investments in our industry. Um, So we can think about sideline generators uh, that may find a new life, uh, which will kind of allow us to test the true resiliency of our system or uh, utilities that are taking a harder look at their, at at their, at modernizing their risk management practices and and rethinking their exposure to both spot and forward market prices. I'm sure somebody's business case for a new technology uh, may be uh, you know, closer to breaking even on a forward price basis. Um, you know, data centers that may be able to load balance are reevaluating their energy optimization schemes. Just collectively, a bunch of small things may be occurring all right now because of these incentives. 
Uh, and those small changes can result in forms of innovation that once made may persist for some time. You know, the only fear here or the only concern here is that the, as we all know, the cure to high prices is high prices. You know, if uh, we see a strong response to these forward market signals, you know, it may result in spot market gluts, which incentivize more of the bad behavior that started this cycle of low investment uh, in the first place. It seems inevitable, uh, but hopefully uh, it will come with some positive change. And given that, I would encourage public power to look for places where you can make positive change now while you have the markets to drive organizational support. I like that perspective that you trying to leverage the opportunity with high forward power prices to, to make good decisions um, in the near term. I also really like that. And I don't know, I've never heard this before, but the cure for high prices is high prices. Is that a common thing that Paul just has never heard of? Absolutely. Okay. Well, I like it. Um, and I, and one of the things, you know, I, I am not a trader, but um, have really firm opinions about product design and retail rate design. And I'm curious if there's a lesson to learn here around, um, you know, revenue credits associated with secondary revenues. Bonneville has revenue credits for some of its products as a slice customer embedded in some of my uh, retail rates are revenue credits um, from wholesale sales. And and, you know, we saw those decrease over, you know, several rate periods where those secondary credits were going down. Now they're going back up. And is there some, am I missing something on a better way to do this going forward? And, and is there a better way for me developing retail rates to take advantage of this moment to kind of rethink philosophically my revenue credit schema? What, what, is there any lesson there? Or uh, am I going to end up cutting this out because it puts you on the spot? It's possible that you'll end up cutting it out because it puts me on the spot. But, you know, uh, you know, embedded within this revenue credit situation is essentially risk and opportunity. And, you know, while right now uh, forward market prices uh, may, you know, be higher because of uh, perceptions or concerns of scarcity, that's not necessarily what we uh, believe the long term trend to be. We're kind of in this moment of transition between you know, the, the portfolio that the region has today and the portfolio that it's likely to have in, in, in the future. And so what happens in the short term in order to uh, essentially come up with a more sensible you know, outlay of secondary credits to uh, Bonneville customers, uh, I think is anyone's guess. I, I know that Bonneville has an interest in making sure that those are stable or as stable as they can be in I'm sure that there are some hedging practices they can bring to bear on that. But you know, again, just a couple of months ago, uh, if anyone told me that uh, market prices for uh, say May, June right now would uh, oftentimes appear or creep up into the $50 range in dailies, uh, you know, I, I probably would have laughed them out of the room. I'm not laughing right now. No, uh, it's one of the things that, you know, I'm at a point in my career where it's not been a short career, but throughout my career, energy prices have been very low. Um, and this is kind of a new point in looking at uh, forwards and seeing them uh, creep up to where some of the contracts that didn't look so great uh, a while ago may actually be in the money in the, in the near term. It's a, it's a crazy time. It's great. Old opportunities are new again. That's right. And it definitely has taken, given me some, some, uh, chance to think through some of those assumptions I've made about the fundamental market. So thanks for coming on and sharing your philosophy on the fundamentals of the market. I really, it's great. Of course, go out there, get innovative, look for things that you can change today. Yes. And the innovation is at the hallmark of both public power underground and my uh, philosophy on retail rate design and vehicle electrification. John, John, have you heard about plug pass yet? Do you want me to tell you? Do we have 50 more minutes where we could just talk about plug pass? I'm all ears, Paul. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, well, I'm just going to put, I'm going to shut down the public power underground recording. We can just talk about it offline. What do you say? Yeah, I love to hear it. Let's hear it. Okay. Thanks, John. Back to the underground for news. Okay. Great conversation with John Hart. Did want to bring it back to the Harkohala hypothesis real quick because they nominated gas again today. So three years, they did not nominate gas. 
And then over the past week, they've nominated it two days at a low level for testing. And then it seems like today they nominated some gas, 12,300 million cubic feet. BPA, BPA hosted the Q2 QBR technical workshop on May 18th. Participants were active in the chat with several questions about the forecast lies true of charge, technical services building, per use and secondary capacity model. Uh, the slice true up is forecast to be a charge to customers totaling 10 million this year due to forecast program expenses. Reserve forecasts are currently strong for all business units. Included in the coverage of reserves was the March payment of 79.7 million worth of transmission business unit, um, RDC proceeds towards transmission, federal debt uh, reduction in uh, addition to the rate case scheduled debt pre repayment of 204.4 million. For more, visit bpa.gov for a copy of their presentation and pending workshop follow-up questions and recording. All right, in another debut appearance, Clark Public Utilities Energy Services Project Manager, Matt Babbitts joined us to talk about Clark's transportation electrif electrification plan and APPA's newly released EV toolkit. Hey, Matt, welcome to Public Power Underground. Well, hi, Paul. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me on the show. It's, it's exciting to participate in what's really become the uh, famous Public Power un Underground. Yeah, uh, the like we're just become a really. It's like, I don't know that we're famous, but we're niche and we have this like cult following amongst some public power professionals that I love. It's great. Well, I'm part of the cult, and uh, it's certainly become a cool platform for discussing industry developments, and Clark Public Utilities appreciates the opportunity to be a part of it. Well, I'm really glad to have you. First, our first person from Clark Public Utilities, and that's a great, I mean, you're going to get the badge of honor walking around <laughs> if you ever get back into the office, if we ever do this again. <laughs> oh, that's great. So I, I tried to tee you up because during our crossover podcast with Public Power Now, we were talking about APPA National Conference. And, you know, as I was going through the agenda, like live on air, I then saw your name and I was like, Matt Babbitts is going to be at the APPA National Conference presenting on, presenting on transportation electrification. These are like niche, like the, the, the most Paul things possible, right? A Northwest Public Power talking about transportation electrification on a national stage. I love it. How to happen? What's going on? Yeah, there's a there's a pretty cool story behind it. And you know, as you know, the APPA National Conference is always a great venue to learn, you know, different valuable industry content and gain some insight from our peers across the country. So we're really excited to have this opportunity to present on Clark's transportation uh, electrification efforts. Um, a little over a year ago, an APPA deed project was put together uh, to develop an EV toolkit for public power utilities. And I had the fortunate opportunity to be a part of that great work. Um, I wasn't on the core team. My role was a public utility advisor, but it was a lot of fun. So the panel that I'm going to be working with at the conference is going to be previewing and demoing that EV toolkit. Okay. which is now available as a resource and a tool to all the APPA members. Okay, that's awesome. So is it on your website? Is it part of this like link on uh, plug and share and stuff on your website that I can get to it somehow? You know, uh, we haven't linked it to our website quite yet, but we will be doing so. I think part of the strategy was to maybe wait till the conference happens and then uh, really highlight it on the webpage. Love it. But key to this, I guess you aren't talking too much about your transportation electrification, maybe the national conference, but it's what I want to talk about because I want to know what Clark's doing for transportation electrification, because I want to learn from all of my peers and I want to try to influence all of you uh, in my way and then also get influenced by you. Let's exchange some information here, Matt. What are you guys, what are y'all doing? Well, that sounds great, Paul, and I'm excited to jump into it. Uh, let me take a quick minute and, and put in a pitch for this toolkit, though, because I think this is okay. really going to be a valuable tool for utilities. And here at Clark, we definitely borrowed and implemented some of the different strategies from the toolkit that are reflected into our programs. Um, in fact, some of the informational graphics that are within the toolkit, you'll find in our transportation electrification plan itself. And those are really just a couple of examples. This toolkit goes a lot deeper, Paul. It can really provide guidance and analysis on some of the technical aspects like EV load growth, charging infrastructure deployment, distribution infrastructure planning, 
return on team investments, and a whole lot more. Um, the toolkit allows utilities to input specific data and metrics from their service territory that will result in a custom analysis that addresses their local goals, opportunities, and challenges. Um, so we really felt like this was a valuable tool for us as we were developing our TE plan. So I would encourage all the public power underground listeners to take a look at it if they have an opportunity to do so. Okay, you gotta tell me now, where to find it though, because when I Google it, it's not that easy. And I don't know that I've found it yet. Even though this is like my super niche and I love everything EVs, I haven't found it yet. I promise to do so, Paul, I will follow up. Okay, um, I'll, I'll put a link in the email. I always link to articles and stuff. So if you send me a link to the EV toolkit, I'll put it in the next, uh, when, I, when I plug you and plug this episode. Got it? Happy to do so. Great. All right, well, let me tell you a little bit more about Clark's TE plan. Um, so, you know, we're really excited to have rolled out this new TE plan, and the process is a lot, has been a lot of fun. Um, the Board of Commissioners officially adopted the plan on March 2nd, and we've really had strong support from the board down to the leadership team and all the way down the staff level here. And I got to say, the customer enthusiasm has been off the charts. Now, Paul, I know you're an EV owner, so you can probably understand that sentiment. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I electrify everything, especially like cars are awesome electrified. A hundred percent. They're so it's, much fun to drive. It's the way you know, the future, I miss the right? third pedal. I do miss the third pedal. I'm not going to lie. I like the shifting, miss it. But if, if you're going to drive a performance vehicle and not have a third pedal, an EV is the only way to go. If there is like a, okay, I want a performance vehicle and a third pedal. Maybe I would still want an engine, but that's the only exception I have. <laughs> Well, it's a small price to pay, right? Exactly. So, uh, you know, looking at our TE plan, um, it of course has several objectives, but first and foremost, we want to increase the adoption of electric vehicles in our service territory. But we also understand we need to maintain the safe, affordable, and reliable electricity service that our customers expect from us. So the plan really ensures that we're maintaining a robust electric system as our customers are adopting EVs more rapidly. Okay. You know, we've also put some effort into highlighting the environmental benefits of EV ownership in Clark County. If you switch from a gas vehicle to an EV that's powered by Clark Public Utilities electricity, it results in nearly a 90% emissions reduction. So EVs really do present an opportunity for customers to immediately reduce their carbon footprint. And that's a story we wanted to tell throughout the TE plan. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into one question here because I, I was wondering if you did any like market intel on what the impediments to adoption are. I think I, one of the things you mentioned that I, I find from our side of the fence is the transportation electrification is largely a risk to the utility and a benefit for our customers. Um, so we're trying to encourage the benefit for our customers without the peak risk for us as a utility. Um, but in encouraging that electrification of transportation. Did you find any things that were the roadblocks that you're that you're trying to uh, remove in your plan specifically? Yeah, we certainly did, Paul. And, and I agree with your analysis. I think if we manage the risk right, though, we can turn that into opportunities for our utilities. 100%. So as we were looking to develop customer facing programs, um, we wanted to focus on those issues that are barriers to adoption and that are also most important to, to the customers, while also keeping in mind the policy objectives and the different mandates we have as a Washington State utility. So we're offering incentives for the installation of level two chargers for both residential and business customers, but uh, also sending a price signal for customers to adopt units that have the ability to connect to the internet. We're hopeful that by having customers adopt connected units, that may present an opportunity for demand response or load management programs down the road. Um, and that will really help us manage that risk that you brought up. 100%. We, we also know that there's, oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, we also know there's a, a cost barrier associated with EV ownership uh, for several of our customers. So our plan and programs do focus on the limited income demographics in Clark County in an effort to try to open the door to EV ownership to that subset of customers. So we're offering a used EV rebate that is up to $2,000 for income qualified customers. 
And that's a program that the entire team at Clark here is really excited about. I love that idea because the used EV market, I think, is a market inefficiency. And if you provide some incentive on the used EV market, because the federal is applies to new. Um, and a lot of times, for as you're talking about the low income members of our community, it's hard. I mean, you can't get a new EV. But if you do an incentive for the used, I love this concept. You're going to have so many wonderful EVs running around your service territory, benefiting your customers. It's a great concept. I love this idea. I should have known about hey, it before. I'm sorry, Paul. Matt. Oh, it's quite all right. You know, the program's just launched in early April, but I am excited to report that we've already had a handful of customers take advantage of this used EV re rebate. So uh, the strategy seems to be working. And again, we're really excited about this one. I don't know. I think we're probably at the end of our rope for this conversation, but I would love to talk about the way you thought through the rebate on EVs, because I think there's a corollary to like our line extension policies, because you can understand that by putting in the new line extension, you can offset the capital cost by the ongoing revenues. And I'm thinking, I'm wondering if you've thought through a similar kind of uh, a cost benefit analysis for the EV uh, promotion or the EV uh, rebates, because there is, if you, if you have an electric vehicle in your system, you're going to get incremental energy sales for its charging. So it seems to me there's some play there. Love to talk to you more about that. We're probably out of time today though. Hey, I understand, Paul. I would uh, certainly welcome a, a second appearance on the Public Power Underground. My door is always open, so reach out whenever uh, it works for you. And thanks again for the opportunity. Really appreciate being on the show. Yeah, great to have you. Tell all your friends at Clark uh, that um, that we're here. Uh, love love y'all's work. And um, you know, Lena was on Public Power Now. I think maybe you know we can get her on the Underground at some point. What do you think? Hey, I'll do my best to make it happen. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Matt. Back to the other ground for news. GoBank launched their podcast, Power Plays, earlier this year, focused on the U.S. power and energy sector. Hosted by Terry Vishwanath, lead energy economist with GoBank's Knowledge Exchange, the podcast invites leaders in the industry, including policymakers and energy innovators, to provide timely key market insights. April's ep episode featured Simon Price, CEO of Exawatt, who shared his valuable insights on solar innovation and cost declines. Vishwanath commented that shifts in policy, technology costs, and consumer requirements have conspired against a business as usual pace to energy transition in 2021. And CoBank's podcast provides a medium to discuss the market's evolution with industry leaders. The podcast is posted on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or a few other places you may also listen. For more, visit cobank.com and search for CoBank launches power plays for the article. Same spots you go to find public power underground, you can find power plays. Very exciting. Love the public power podcast content. And you know, maybe we're considered energy innovators. Maybe we can get on there, team. Wouldn't that be great? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what my thought was. Some crossover Ryan. pods. I love the crossover pods. Engineering pop quiz. How many exawatts equal one gigawatt? No idea. It's a really big number. It's really big. I, yeah. Better expressed in uh, in scientific notation than zeros, for sure. I want to know how many gigawatts that is, actually. <laughs> An enthusiastic public power advocate, a new friend of the underground, Energy Northwest project specialist and public power underground's newly appointed special recruitment correspondent, Sarah Giomi, joins the underground to talk about a public power pilot program for interns that was featured in NWPPA's February Bulletin. Hey, Sarah, welcome to Public Power Underground. Hi, Paul. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm excited to have you on. Some good energy. We're going to have some great yes. conversations. Oh, it's going to be great. I'm so excited to be here. Okay. So uh, a, a few weeks ago, maybe even a month ago by now, I was talking to Libby Kalman from Hood River Electric Cooperative, and we were talking about the talent pipeline yes. from local colleges and universities. And, you know, apparently we don't read <laughs> the bulletin because you had an article in there, you were highlighted yes. in Energy Northwest program. So in 200 words or less, what's Energy Northwest doing? Yes. So right now, Energy Northwest is facilitating a 
public power internship program with some really great utilities here in the region. And basically what we're doing is we met together and said, if we can help you with anything, you know, what can we help you with? And we totally related to what Libby was talking about, about recruiting and public power. And, you know, with so much of the workforce retiring and trying to get people interested in public power, we decided that, you know, growing the workforce really starts at that college level and in internships. So we created this program where they don't just have a job for the summer. They're part of this program where they work with the utility and they get exposure to all different utilities, not just one, in public power, and really understand what public power is and what it's like to work in the public power community. Because once we get them hooked, we're going to keep them, aren't we? Yes. Which is great. Yes, we will. And they get to be a part of the community. They understand what is public power really, and they get to um, get that feel of what making a difference is like in public power. Love it. Now, it seems like you have some passion around internships. Is there a backstory there? I do. So I actually started at Energy Northwest as an intern, and now I'm with Energy Services and Development Team, and I'm so excited to be a part of this because I see it from both perspectives. I understand, you know, the student side of wanting to start to get your toes in, you know, that career that they want to be a part of and see what they like and what they don't like, but also something that's so much bigger than themselves and more than just a summer job, because anybody can go get a summer job, but an experience where they leave with a network and a community, and they've gotten to meet leadership at these utilities, that's the experience we want to be giving people in public power. Yeah, and it sounds like you have, this is a pilot program. It's Mm -hmm. a a few utilities, a few of your member utilities have signed up for this, they're going to have interns. What, how, how to grow this, like could, We're an Oregon utility. Could we sign up and become one in the future? And what are the colleges on the other side that you're you're recruiting from? Yes. So we are recruiting with all colleges. We're on Handshake. So we get to do a lot of different virtual career fairs, which has been great. That is one good thing that's come out of COVID is we get to meet even more students. And what's wonderful is this program isn't just for our members because we created this with other utilities to help serve more utilities. And the best part is the more utilities that are a part of this program, the less expensive it is to have an internship program. So we get to help them with recruiting, interviewing, um, getting them established, hosting orientations, hosting events all summer. So it really is, you know, it's a great opportunity to expand public power internships, but also save utilities cost as well. You're just hitting on all the right notes there. It's like, you know what to do in order to communicate effectively. This is great. Um, so, uh, we can sign up. How do we, how do we learn more and who do we contact to try to get involved in this for next summer? Sounds like it's not going to be until next summer. Yes. So it is starting this summer, but but next summer. Yes. So we have a few, we have seven interns this summer and then next summer we're actually hoping to expand. So instead of just engineering internships, it will be human resources, finance, and additional interns. And you can reach me at S Emma's and Margaret. Giomi, G-I-O-M-I, at energy-northwest.com. And I'm happy to share more information. And we will have um, a website up within um, a month or two. Okay. I tried to navigate. I tried to zoom in on your oh, email it's address It's right there, there at the bottom. Right it by is. Your yes. I tried to zoom in and instead okay. I just, I just navigated to other pages, but this is we an audio form. got a good form. of the bulletin. And you got, uh, you got your web, your, your email in there, which is great. So yes. I decided that my contribution would be to come up with a public power pledge that we could have all of the interns recite. So yes. I'm hoping you can come back uh, with some interns, yes. and we can recite a public power pledge that highlights yes. on the core topics of public power, like avoiding pivot tables, V lookups, and advocacy for daylight savings time. All that. These are core Absolutely. topics for the public core. power and public power underground uh, fan base. So let's do it. Let's have some back. Yes. Let's talk about it again. We will have them back, and they will be public power pros. Yes. I love the alliteration. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Please come back. Let's do this again. I cannot wait to come back. Thank you so much, Paul. Now back to the underground for news. 
Great energy from Sarah Giomi. Really good conversation. I think this podcast has a really good niche on like entrance into public power. So like if the newly uh, adopted people that have come into our public power community, this is a great podcast to like learn about everything we're talking about and get familiar with concepts in a very friendly way. We're very kind people. We try to be very positive about the community that we're involved in. So we're really hoping, Sarah, you forward this on to all the interns and that those uh, anybody that's entering the industry gets hooked up with Public Power Underground. We think it's a really good fit. Okay, in some long-awaited and exciting news out of Italy, Lamborghini has announced an upcoming all-electric car. No words on the specs or pricing or exact timeline yet, but the supercar manufacturer has some ground to cover as word also came out this morning that the SpaceX package Tesla Roadster is looking to achieve a zero to 60 mile per hour time of 1.1 seconds. For more on both announcements, check out the electric blog. Does the electric blog also have any commentary about the F-150 Lightning? It does. Yes, and it does. And I think does. it has pricing and specs. It looks like the, the pricing is, is pretty decent. It's does it keep... have anything about the frunk? Because I think that may be the most uh, attractive feature because you have a trunk now in a truck. Yep. Uh, that was one of the main uh, aspects that they covered, I think, think, in the electric blog. I believe there was also a, a Ford employee on Twitter kind of trolling uh, Chevy about the the frunk or something along those lines is good content i always enjoy the electric content it's really good stuff uh that's that's a good point like with with the frunk if you open it up is the grill going to raise too because then you you don't have to lift things as high to it get does it in. yeah at least based on the pictures it does based on the pictures for sure look at that oh it's so nice nice yeah like on-demand content from google Great I believe there's also outlets in there and um, I don't maybe even an inverter, some pretty awesome stuff. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. That's a good point, though, um, if these F-150s end up being great fleet vehicles as well for utilities and others, because uh, I know that Ford is a uh, well thought of brand in those applications and American made. So could be some really cool applications. Might be seeing them with utility logos driving around in the next year or two. Absolutely. You probably won't be able to tell the difference between the other fleet trucks either because they do look fairly close. I mean, they look like an F-150. It doesn't yep. look. The only thing that's really different is, the, you know, the where you plug in is in the front quarter panel instead of the rear quarter panel where you fill up with gas. The other really innovative thing that I, I didn't see in these, we didn't research this because it wasn't going to be part of our episode, but they do have a feature where you can backfeed your home in the event of an outage. Uh, and they're partnering with some uh, yes. electrician, electric companies to, uh, to come up with all of the infrastructure you need to be able to smoothly do that. It's really cool. Yeah, I think they're one of the first auto manufacturers to actually like take that on. I know there are others have been concerned about the the battery uh, life reductions, which I don't think is actually a huge concern, but Ford is just diving into it. And I think that's great. Yeah, it's really cool. This is really, we went further into the F-150 Lightning than we did the Lamborghini, which is also cool. But uh, the F-150 Lightning is probably more influential to the actual adoption of electric vehicles than Lamborghini, even though the Lamborghini going electric is really cool. I agree. The, the Lamborghini is super cool. Not that uh, useful for, for most folks out there, but I'm really interested to see, because obviously Lamborghinis cost a lot of money. And Paul and I were talking about this briefly, like, what can they actually do to make it better than a uh, SpaceX Tesla Roadster and make it worth the cost? I mean, you can't get really that much faster. One there is a one. limit to how fast I want to be able to accelerate um, in a vehicle. It's There's a limit. I don't know what it is, Brian. I really don't know what my limit is. Um, so Ian has some 1. data 1 on, seconds. on um, like uh, funny cars. Ian, do you want to share that? It's I don't not to... those uh, funny cars are different that one is a the one i looked up is a top fuel dragster those are the ones that are really long they got tiny wheels on the front and they accelerate so fast that before the rear wheels even pass the starting line they're already doing in excess of 60 miles per hour and it was zero to hundred zero to one hundred 
Point eight. Yep. Yep. That this no, was but the, that's this not, was our conversation. That, there. I think that's 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 hundredths of seconds slower, you know. The Tesla Roadster would be hundredths of seconds slower. Not like a second slower, hundredths of a second. It's crazy. There I don't know if you're tenths? gonna be able to find the um yeah, uh tenths. There's a video, so there's good. a um uh I don't know what the word for it is. There's a video that somebody mocked up. It was computer generated that shows how fast a Tesla Roadster accelerates that it shows zero to 60 in 1.1 seconds. And it's, it's pretty quick with the little uh, cold, uh, cold gas rockets or whatever they call them. It was also interesting okay. that Elon said the, uh, the updated Roadster is going to look way better. Okay. <laughs> I don't. I think it looks really cool. It'd be great if they were actually stuff. commercially available. We're returning to power, powerful resource adequacy program development to learn more from PGP senior policy analyst Leah Fisher. Hey, Leah, welcome to Public Power Underground. It's great to be here. I've been kind of creeping in and listening for the past month, so happy to finally contribute something. So you, you have some idea of what you're getting into, which is, which is really hopeful for me. I think so. I think Good. so. <laughs> um, I, you're the first uh, PGP staffer to be on it. Big fan of PGP. This guy's a big fan. Awesome. Well, I'm happy to be the first representative. Hopefully I can do a good job. Yeah, you, you all do great work. I'm very confident you'll be able to do this well. But in this instance, you have two hats. So you're a PGP staffer, advocates for your membership and when it comes to the resource adequacy program, but you also have a separate hat um, helping the uh, power pool work through the program. I wanna focus first on PGP members and what they are focused on in, in this resource adequacy program. Can you talk to a little bit about the elements that they think are critical to the success and, and what they're interested in making sure gets developed properly? Yeah, sure. And I will definitely get into some of those elements, but I guess just just first to start, I mean, I think, you know, we public PGP and its members, you know, I think we can't emphasize how important RE is to our members. Um, you know, I think if you were to ask any utility in today's world with all of the recent load shed events that have been occurring, you know, certainly I think a lot of electric utilities would say keeping the lights on and reliability is priority number one. And I, I think our members would agree with that. But I think even before some of those extreme events, um, with Kaiso and ERCOT, resource adequacy just has been a forefront of what we really care about. Um, and so, you know, a number of years back, PGP did a study with E3 and partnered um, with some others in the region to, to consider adequacy issues. And since that time, um, the results of that study really have led us to kind of be galvanized around what are some options for enhancing adequacy in the region. And I think, you know, our, our members are differently positioned. We've got some that are, you know, very long and then some that are, you know, approaching capacity need. But I think the common denominator is that adequacy is important and this RA program may be a really valuable first step um, to accomplishing some of those goals around reliability in the future. Probably not the only step, but certainly a really worthwhile first step to take um, to achieving those goals. And then as far as sort of what are the most important components to the program for our uh, members and how they've been thinking about it. I mean, I think Certainly thinking about um, governance is always a really important issue. I think, you know, region wide, that's been something that's been um, a focal point. So I think we're keeping a close eye on how that is set up and structured. Um, I think definitely the details around the treatment of hydro in the program. Um, we have, of course, a lot of members with a lot of hydro. So considering how hydro is treated in this program in general for a region that has so much hydro is kind of a unique, a new concept. So I think thinking through those details is also important. And then, um, you know, again, thinking through like transmission deliverability within the program and how that works, that's kind of a concept that I think in general for a lot of um, stakeholders and those that are working on the program design, something that we know is important and, and needs to be figured out. So um, I would say those are probably some areas where we're kind of keeping close tabs on the design and it's PGP trying to um, help communicate as we can development that's being done on those fronts. 
And is your uh, as you're working at the PGP hat on, is, are you trying to both advocate at the the power pool and the program development and and inform your members, or how are you thinking about engagement um, in yeah. in developing the program? Yeah, great question. So yeah, so we PGP is sitting in. Um, watching and helping with this program, but it's not uh, as a steering committee member. So we're not a utility involved in the effort ourselves. So we're not involved in any of the decision-making on program design or any sort of the consensus votes that take place to kind of move through design. But we are trying to socialize with our members when elements become public, help communicate that. And so for our members that aren't participating on the design, um, in the design process as steering committee members, helping bring them along and then helping coordinate for those in the program that are participating as steering committee members, um, you know, kind of acting as sort of a facilitator for them on key issues. And then that other hat that you mentioned, so uh, what role beyond kind of helping our members um, understand and conceptualize the program are we taking? So we're um, very involved in the stakeholder engagement uh, piece of the program. Uh, so that means we are helping with all of the outreach that's done in the region. So in terms of those Ask Jeff videos you may have seen, we're helping with those concepts. Uh, so I have the in on David Pennington. I hear you're a fan. I Big fan talk to him every week. So if you want to get in touch with him, I've got a cell. Love uh, <laughs> and yeah, so beyond the videos, uh, you know, the stakeholder advisory committee that's been tasked with providing input on this program. We're helping with all of that outreach, setting up those meetings, setting up public webinars, um, disseminating information within the region as best we can on the on the program. And I think, you know, one of the reasons we're involved in in that particular piece is, you know, of course, our our members, you know, volunteered us to to play that role. But I think the reason why they did that is just a recognition that you know, stakeholder engagement is really, really key to having regional efforts like this succeed. Um, you know, it can be a piece that sometimes gets forgotten or undervalued, but in order for something as big as what this RA effort is trying to do to succeed, you really do, you do have to get the buy-in from other stakeholders in the region and get their input. And yeah, it can be challenging, but I think yeah. it's really important. Yeah, well, as as a, a non-PGP member who also is not a member of the steering committee for the power pool, I do, like, I think I share some of the, like, big areas of interest, right, governance and uh, making sure hydro's capability and transmission are valued properly. Can you provide any, like, high level, oh, this is fine, you don't need to worry about it, Paul, this is going to be great? <laughs> <laughs> or is there some areas where you think, okay, even though, um, you know, we're, we're moving forward, there may be areas to focus in on and those big three areas that uh, need further development or to really focus on in the detailed design paper? Because I think the detailed design is coming to a close. Um, is there something I should be focused on? Those three things. Yeah. So, you know, I would say that I do have a lot of confidence in the work that's being done within the steering committee um, on these three issues. So really kind of taking a step back and reflecting on what's been accomplished thus far. I've been super impressed. I mean, this is a diverse group of public power IOUs. Uh, you know, you've got SPP as your program developer, you've got powerful representatives, you've got a program manager and you're all together in this room. And it's amazing actually what's been accomplished thus far and how much consensus there really has been. And so I would just kind of emphasize that, you know, this group is meeting three meetings a week, six hours total a week, and there's just a ton of thought that's being put into this. And so I think, you know, probably on the, for those that are not sitting in that room working on it, I can totally understand why there might be kind of some gaps and some desire to know more and maybe some kind of, you know, curiousness about certain elements and how far are we along and are we okay here? Um, so I can appreciate that, but I would just say, um, I do have a lot of confidence that the issues will be resolved. And I think there will be uh, more to come publicly soon as well as we get close to that phase two B endpoint, more to share um, and hopefully bring everyone else along. Yeah, love it. Um, not sure if you're contractually obligated to make that uh, <laughs> statement that you're confident in it or not, but we'll pivot, um, which uh, you had a great pivot on where to learn more because it, you are hosting some series of load serving entity webinars for those that like, like Classic and IPUD that have not been involved in the process. Can you give us a pitch, a promo, promote that for us? 
Oh, yes, sure. Yeah. So coming up this Friday, there is going to be the first meeting in a series of we're anticipating about four meetings um, called the Load Service Information Forum. And so this forum is trying to really meet the need for those that have not been participating at the steering committee level, but are load serving entities and may be interested potentially in joining the RA program and even potentially joining as soon as this fall when the non-binding stage um, opens up that you have, you know, all the information that you might need to make that decision. So that's a little uh, ambitious. <laughs> you think? I think so. <laughs> yes, we're feeling that too. Uh, so there's been lots of frantic compiling of slide materials, but really, you know, thinking through what are the issues that, what are the questions people need answered to make a decision? What information do they need? And we're going to be kind of throwing it back on you all as well at the end of this first meeting to say, here's what we gave you. What else do you still need? Yep. Love the ambition uh, to try to get us all involved. Um, we're ready. We're excited for the information. I can definitely tell when we attend these public workshops that you know, a lot of people in similar similarly situated utilities to me are anxious to learn more. Uh, think it's strategically important. And I kind of glossed over um, wanting to know the specific things because we always talk about the strategic value of a program like this. But yeah. the, you know, the the details matter, um, and I'm glad you're involved advocating for utilities like us um, and, and your membership. So thank you very much. Yeah, great to be here and great to chat with you, Paul. Anything else that you want to pitch or promote other than the power pool stuff? Anything cool coming out of PGP in, in the near future? Mm, or out actually, of yeah. Future? So I was, you know, a lot of my kind of takeaways with respect to what's going on with the RA effort um, have really been really helpful to put in context of other regional efforts uh, that we've undertaken in the region over the past 20 years. So we're doing some fun work. We're doing a market, uh, I think we're calling it the retrospective. So we're basically looking back over what's happened in the region in the last 20 years as far as regional efforts and where did we succeed, where did we not? And for me, it's been really um, helpful and informative. So I'd um, be happy to come back another time and let you know what we find. Success, you volunteered, you're coming <laughs> back. It's gonna happen. Thank you very much for coming today. It's been great to talk to you. Great, thanks so much. Back to the underground for news. Okay, that's all the news we're covering this week. Send us any news, questions, opinions, or corrections to Paul on Twitter, at a power manager. Or if you're a friend, friend of the underground, send any of us a note. Do we have anything coming up to preview or promote, Paul? We do. We always do. Um, this time is no different. But next week, we have a special After Dark episode um, where we're going to be doing a mailbag with Susan Ackerman. We have a cast of great cast of characters from around the region to field all the questions that our friends of the underground have submitted. It's going to be fun, exciting, educational, probably chaotic. It's going to be great. Also wanted to note that it will serve as the season two finale. And I've mocked up a, like a little uh, Ted Lasso inspired season two finale speech. I've been working on it. I'm going to keep trying to hone that down because we got to believe, man. We got to believe. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm looking forward to it. I Obviously, I mentioned I can't participate, so I'm going to be excited to watch it like all of our friends of the underground do for these episodes normally. So... Uh, Let's see, that means this is the last regularly formatted episode of season two. The sappy season, the season of hope, the corny season. Public Power Underground will probably be back for season three, but the power department is changing and evolving. Even if we come back, we'll be different. The promise of innovation and creativity is foundational to Public Power Underground. To make sure you don't miss the premiere of season three or enter any intervening announcements about Public Power Underground, you should subscribe on all of our platforms. Find us on YouTube, Substack, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify by searching for Public Power Underground. Smash those subscribe buttons. And if you have access to an Apple device, Apple device, hit that fifth star and write a quick note. It doesn't have to be profound, just some words of encouragement. As long as there's five stars, um, that's really what we're looking for. Um, that's all we have for this week. So thanks for tuning in. Hey, public, power people. We're public Power Underground is a Northwest Public Power. No, I'm doing that one forever. again. Public Power Underground is Northwest Public Power news from a power department's perspective presented for entertainment purposes. It's written, edited, and produced by the power department. The views expressed here are our own and not the official views of Klotzkin IPUD, nor of any person or organization affiliated or doing business with Klotzkin IPUD, nor the organization of guests also appearing on Public Power Underground. 
Neither Klatsk and IPUD nor those appearing on Public Power Underground generate ad revenue from the episodes. Make Leah, Matt, Sarah, and John feel better about their participation in this week's episode by sending them a note, text, or email with a thumbs up and telling them how much you enjoyed it. Do it for us, do it for them, and do it to make other people feel valued and appreciated. Public Power Underground for electric utility enthusiasts. Public Power Underground, it's work to watch.